country against which he is fighting and the people of that country welcome him with open arms. Like Gandhi goes to London in 1931 for the second round table conference uh, to negotiate the freedom for India. And he's a man who is fighting against the British colonial power. And there are thousands of people lying the road in heavy rains and cold to have a glimpse of a man who wants them out of his country. So this is also a very spiritual phenomenon because Gandhi never fought the British people. He fought the colonial rule. He was against the sin, not the sinner. And Gandhi saw divinity in everybody. And that is an idea of uh, spirituality. That is the idea of spiritualism, which I'm sort of uh, very, very, very comfortable with. A uh, little bit later, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more elaborately about Gandhi and his idea of spirituality and Gandhi and his religion. But before that, I must tell you a little bit about uh, my other love. So as I told you, I was a medical doctor at a hospital. I did it for about 10 years. I started the first hospital in Kalangut. And initially, my patients were all the fishermen. And slowly, there was a boom in tourism, and the hippies started coming. <laughs> Actually, Alfonso de Albuquerque discovered Goa for the Portuguese, and the hippies discovered it for the world. <laughs> so hippies started coming, and slowly, a lot of British people started coming. And then, almost 70, 80% of my patients were British people. And they were suffering only from one disease, loose motions. <laughs> so the idea of devoting my life to British loose motions was not very palatable. <laughs> I thought India has taken enough shit from the British for 150 years. <laughs> and I didn't want to take any more. So I gave up my medical profession and I started uh, working on art. And for the last 30 years, I have been basically <laughs> Uh, well, before I move on to uh, my how art is connected with the spiritual, uh, I must talk a little bit about what kind of a world we live in, where this idea of art and spirituality can be injected or can be garnished with. What is the kind of a world we live in? I think, again, mentioning Gandhi, we are in, so in a kind of a rat race. Gandhi traveled from London to South Africa in 1909 and on this journey he wrote one full book which is almost the bible of Gandhian thought. It's called the Hindu Swaraj and it is a critic of the western civilization. It is not anti-science book, it is not a criticism of the west, but it is a uh, critic of the western civilization. Uh, he was not against machines, he was against the use of machines uh, not for humanity. So anyway, that's a different subject and in one prize I don't speak on two subjects. So, uh, well, so Gandhi wrote this book uh, called uh, The Hindu Swaraj. Uh, so we today live in a world where everybody is in a hurry. We don't have something called society anymore. We only have a market. We don't have people anymore. We don't have citizens anymore. We only have uh, consumers. I was just imagining if some CEO of some big corporation is going for a space tourism and he goes into the space and then he's looking at a lovely earth, what will he exclaim? What would he sort of, uh, I mean people might say beautiful and whatever, looking at the earth from the space, he would say my market. Because the earth has become a market. And everything what we do is basically uh, for the benefit of the corporate world. As my friend Ashok Vajpayee says, he says that we don't have any uh, political agenda anymore. We are only corporate agendas, the market agendas. So we have become sort of a, uh, consumers. And we have, we have been, uh, everybody is trying to sell us something. And if we have to talk about the biggest violence of this century, that is the violence of the market. Uh, we are basically bombarded with goods, buy, buy, if you buy, you will be happy. Uh, so the idea of uh, uh, happiness is sort of uh, buy and you will be happy. Actually this is a big, big uh, kind of paradox because I basically believe that there is a huge difference between happiness and pleasure. 
There's a huge difference. We are bombarded with, okay, buy something, you have something, you'll be happy. But all these things which you can buy, anything which you can buy can give you pleasure, a momentary pleasure. Pleasure is temporary. Happiness is a little bit long lasting. Pleasure is enjoyed by the individual. Happiness is enjoyed in a group, a social groups. Pleasure can be very addictive. Happiness can never be addictive. Have you heard of anybody who can become sort of addicted to happiness? No. Pleasure is something which can get out of substances. Uh, in the morning my friend is talking about somaras. Somaras, I think, can give you pleasures. But happiness, I doubt. Because anything which is addictive, that can bought, can give you temporary happiness. But for the permanent kind of a, uh, happiness, you need happiness, you need not, uh, not substances. Because uh, pleasure is dopamine and happiness is serotonin. So anyway, so today we are living in a world where we have been sold pleasure in the name of happiness. We have become consumers and we are in a kind of a rat race to get some kind of a success. And in this kind of a world, we are now talking about art and spirituality. I basically believe that art and spirituality are kind of sisters, or I would say they are almost synonymous. And I'm going to give a proposition, I have to make a proposition that art and spirituality together, I mean, are sort of the most, uh, they are together, they are like sisters. And what is the function? What is the function of art and what is the function of spirituality together? And I would say the most important role of art and spirituality is to destroy the dichotomy of meaning. What I mean by that is we, there is always us and the other. The world is divided. Us and the other. Inner and the outer. The body and the soul. Hindus and Muslims. Uh, this nation and that nation. So there is a kind of a dichotomy. And this dichotomy of existence is broken by art and spirituality. Uh, in the morning I was uh, speaking to Vidya and she added one more thing to it. Because she was holding her cat. And then I realized it's not, it's also human beings and animals. There's again a dichotomy we have played. And she has broken that because she is an artist and she holds the cat as much as she would have mourned any human being who died in a family. So this dichotomy is what we should be breaking. And art and spirituality basically play a huge role in breaking this dichotomy. Uh, You know, human beings are a little different from animals because our needs are a little different. I don't know whether the devil will agree with me, but in a sense that a dog or a cat perhaps does not have a sense of eternity or perhaps does not have a sense of history. A dog may know a few dogs around and might know a beautiful looking beach in the other street. But a dog may not be aware that there is a dog which existed in the 17th century or the 18th century. Well, maybe, I am not a canine expert, but maybe, but I think we presume that only human beings have a sense of history. We have a sense of uh, mortality, we have a sense of memory, we have a sense of divine, we have a sense of spiritual, we have the sense of uh, mortality and therefore eternity. See, all of these are sort of functions of the human brain. And the greatest creation of the human brain, perhaps, which also was analyzed by my friend Matthew, is that, okay, we started thinking about what is the meaning of life. Way back, a few thousand years BC, we started thinking about this. So I think that makes us different. So our needs are a little bit different from the needs of the animals. And these are the needs which are addressed by arts and spirituality. I will basically tell you how. See, basically when I'm talking about spirituality, it's becoming one with the whole cosmos. Spirituality tells you that you are just a little speck of the whole existence, and but you are still connected. For example, you look at a star, and if you are weeping, then perhaps you know that might be there is a star up there in the whole cosmos who might be also weeping with you. So that connects you to the whole cosmos. There are lovely poems by Tagore, Rumi, and many of the poets.
roadside wire. I mean, he says, where, where is that unseen flame of darkness whose sparks are the stars? Where is that unseen flame of darkness whose sparks are the stars? So that is the kind of poetry only human beings can create to connect with the cosmos. Stars twinkle to the music of silence. So beautiful. That's Tagore, by the way. So stars twinkle to the music of silence. So these are the kind of ideas that the human brain can come up with which helps us to connect with the cosmos. And that's what makes us different. That's what makes us spiritual. Uh, well, I talked about the body and the soul, the dichotomies. I will come to a few more dichotomies. For example, uh, we talk about the body and the soul. But it perhaps it's also possible to think that the soul is the intangible body and the body is the tangible soul. That's also an interesting idea to think of. And Einstein has already proven that matters and energy can be can move, can be transformed. So we don't have to really think that we are not to be proud of our body, only of our soul, let us just work on the soul. I think we could work on the body as well as the soul and they could be very much connected. So this kind of a dichotomy, art can think of breaking, spirituality can think of breaking. Uh, art does not basically believe in the right and the wrong. There's a beautiful poem by Rumi. He says, there's a field of the right and there's a field of the wrong and beyond that field there is another field. Let us meet there. So spirituality holds your hand and takes you to that field. Because art and spirituality never tell you the final truth. It only tells you a substantial truth. The rest of the truth is depending on the viewer. You create a work of art, it's not the final truth. I don't tell you like Mr. Modi, this is it, take it. No. You are given an opportunity to analyze it, to respond to it, to interpret it. So art is a democratic uh, platform where you are invited to interpret. You are invited to add your own truth to the truth which the artist gives you. And that's the beauty of art. Um, see, art makes uh, the mundane very spiritual. So look at Van Gogh's shoe. He painted that shoe. It's a simple shoe everybody looks at all the time. But Van Gogh creates that shoe. He just doesn't make a photograph of that shoe. He creates the shoe. He, he paints perhaps the soul of the shoe. And that shoe becomes a very important object of art. So the mundane becomes spiritual. That's what art can do. Uh, I had a friend who was not exactly uh, very much initiated into arts. So he said, I have a wall. Let me see, what shall I do with this wall? town planning and uh, panchayat and all the authorities, they would, they would allow me to break that wall. I said, no, when I said break it, I did not mean that you actually physical, physically break it. You hang a work of art there. When you hang a work of the art there, the wall is broken. That work of art trans transports you to somewhere else. It takes you outside. So all of us have some kind of walls which we build around us. And art and the spiritualism has the power to break those walls. I think uh, Vidya would like this story very much because it's about Kumar Gandharu. Uh, you know, during 1975, during the emergency, a uh, lot of leaders were imprisoned by the then government. And one of the leaders imprisoned was Mr. Madhu Limay. Madhu Limay was a socialist leader who was opposing Indira Gandhi, and he was imprisoned in some prison, I think, in Bangalore. Now, he was a great fan of Kumar Gandharva, the great singer. And every day he used to listen to Kumar Gandharva's Kabir. And he wrote a letter to Kumar Gandharva that said, Kumarji, Panditji, her roj, every day I listen to your uh, singing, every day. And when I listen to your singing, I feel I have touched the mystery of the cosmos. Now, he is in the prison, he is not even free. But yet, listening to music, you can touch the mystery of the cosmos. You do not own the cosmos, but art makes you touch the mysteries. You know, science talks about, we're going to demolish these mysteries. 
Because science is all out in a way to say, okay, one day or the other we will solve this. Uh, whatever, whether it is a mystery of cancer or whether it is a mystery of this or mystery of that, how this functions. But then, uh, art does not agree with that. Art celebrates mysteries. Because some mystery has to remain. There is a very beautiful essay by Tagore which is talking about science and art. I'm, I'm sorry I'm deviating a little bit because that's what happens uh, when you perhaps uh, you speak on spirituality and art, it's like singing, you decide to have a new time. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there's a lovely uh, story of Tagore, uh, uh, essay by Tagore, who talks about the art and science. He says, all the scientists are travelers, fellow travelers, in different compartments of one train, going to one destination. All the scientists are different colleagues in compartments, different compartments of one train going to the same destination. Where they basically, uh, the, the, the individuals there go to one universal truth, which is sort of what they want to find out. But art is different. Art and spiritualism are independent travelers. They don't travel in the train. They travel alone. They travel alone and then, during that travel, the universal becomes the individual. The universal becomes the individual. I mean, the, 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 the one individual sort of connects with the whole cosmos. There's a lovely poem by Tagore, another one, which says, Where roads are made, I lose my way. Where roads are made, I lose my way. There are no roads in the sky, and there are no roads in the sea. And sometimes I feel the blood which runs into my veins has the yearning of the unknown way. So art and spiritualism is that no yearning for the unknown. So only those who dare can go there. Those who want to be satisfied with the four walls can stay there. If you want to be an artist or you want to be spiritual, you have to dare to break the walls and join the whole cosmos. Yeah. Um, you know, art has also another function and spiritualism has another in the republic of the spiritual, in the republic of the art, everybody is equal. There is no uh, richer and poorer. There is no bigger and smaller. So can spirituality be divided? That this my spirituality is superior to yours? No, it does not happen. Neither. You cannot say that spirituality is a continuous thing. Spirituality has defies time. Art defies time. Spirituality of Bahad Darashio. Uh, when he was the Darashwa was uh, Shah Jahan's son who was uh, sort of studying uh, his spirituality and my spirituality and Vidya's spirituality and Emil's spirituality is the same. It's like, I mean, the Ragas, whether when Tansen sang some Raga and when Vidya sang some Raga, those Ragas connect centuries. So art connects centuries. When you look at a sculpture which is done in Elora, which is maybe 2000 years old, that sculpture also looks at you. So you connect with the past, you, you break all the walls. There's a very beautiful poem again by Tagore regarding this. He says, Shah Jahan, Shah Jahan built Taj Mahal, and uh, he was imprisoned by his own son, and he died, as the story goes, looking at the Taj Mahal. So he says, Shah Jahan, you allowed your empire to perish, because he lost his empire, but your wish was to make imperishable a teardrop of love. Because Taj Mahal was built for his wife Mumtaj. So, Shah Jahan, you allowed your empire to perish, but your wish was to make imperishable a teardrop of love. Time has no pity for human heart. It laughs at our struggle to remember. But you, Shah Jahan, you allured time with beauty, made him captive, and crowned the formless death with fadeless form. Centuries passed by, empires are reduced to dust. But the night still sighs to the sky, I remember. But that is the power of art. Uh, it sort of, it can defy time. Uh, with, uh, alluring time with beauty, making time captive and crowning the formless death with fadeless form. It's a wonderful line by Tabo. Yeah. Um, well, all of us have mortality. We know we will die. Unlike animals, perhaps animals come to know that they're going to die at the last moment. But we, right from when we were young, we know one day we're going to die. And since we're going to die, 
uh, we have to come to terms with uh, the death. And it's only the human beings and the spiritual who kind of sort of put their hand on the shoulders of death and walk and uh, also feel very, very comfortable. Uh, there's a one, I don't know who is the poet, but I love this poem very much, so I'm going to recite it to you. Only when I drink from the lake of silence, only when I drink from the lake of silence, I should really begin to sing. Only when I drink from the lake of silence, I shall begin to sing. Only when I have reached the peak of the mountain, I shall begin to climb. And only when my limbs are consumed by the earth, I shall really start dancing. So there's such a wonderful uh, dialogue with death. This can only happen through art and spirituality. And I think uh, the last one I'm going to tell you, uh, before I go on to showing some of my works which connect me with spirituality, is a poem which uh, is about eternity. But if you have to accept mortality, you also think about eternity. And this is again think a poem again by Tagore. He says, when death knocks on my door, when death knocks on my door and says your time has come, I shall tell death I never lived in time. I lived in for love. <laughs> When death knocks on my door and says, your time has come, I shall tell death I never lived in time, I lived in love. And when death asks me, will your sculptures be remembered forever? I shall tell death I do not know, but when I created them, I felt eternity. Oh. Yeah. Well, so thank you. And uh, well, I'm going to just make comments on some of my works. So now, what happens is, uh, well, this is uh, some, uh, I mean, I believe in humor has a big power. Uh, well, so this is usually the uh, approach towards spirituality of many people. And I also find today that, you know, spirituality has been drained of all religions. Hmm? And then there are so many commercial babas who almost have a thermometer, like a spiritometer, who tells you how much and, 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 and enlightened you are. There's <laughs> a level of enlightenment. So they have created this thermometer, like uh, the spiritometer. This is my drawing, I did it yesterday especially for you. <laughs> yeah. This is a work by a Tibetan artist. He's uh, very well known, he lives in America. What he has done is uh, he has created the word God using plastic stickers. And the stickers which kids use on their uh, <laughs> books and bags. And this is one of my works where, you know, the ritual remains. The spiritual is God. That happens very, very often. And I must say that many, I mean, when you see uh, the religion, the politics of religion and what is happening, you realize it is just a futile ritual. I'm not against ritual, by the way, because you had a puja this morning. And uh, uh, so I can't say that I'm against ritual. But I must tell you a story. My, one of my friends, again, Ashok Vajpayee, his daughter was getting married. And Ashok Vajpayee is an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. And yet, he called a priest for doing the uh, marriage of his daughter. And there was a mandapa, there was this shamiana kind of thing put. And the priest was sort of uh, doing like usual, uh, super fast, uh, bullet train kind of uh, mantra. He said, wait, 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 please say it slowly. So let me understand what you are saying. Because uh, Ashok Vajpayee knows Sanskrit and he is very well educated. So the priest started saying, he says, for my daughter's wedding, O God, I invite you. All the gods, I invite you. The cats, the animals, the deers, everybody, you to come for this marriage. The plants, the trees, the banyan tree and this tree, or you also attend my marriage. Now, look at this beauty. For your daughter's marriage, you are inviting the trees, you are inviting the animals, you are inviting the clouds, you are inviting the birds. Now this kind of a poetry, this kind of a spiritual is the wonderful thing about ritual. Because I think it is bliss, blissful. Has, can we imagine that you are giving invitation to the whole world to attend and bless your daughter's wedding? So that's the beauty of, uh, I mean, so I have nothing against ritual, but the ritual which is meaningful. But what does happen usually is that most religions of the world are drained of spiritual and they have become a bundle of rituals. And I'm not saying it very cynically, but <laughs> so this is my teacher in spiritualism, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, 
I found this cardiogram. I am working with Gandhi for the last uh, seven years, and his grandson became a good friend of mine, Raj Mohan Gandhi, and he connected me with uh, many uh, Gandhi museums. And uh, he knew that I am originally an ex-doctor. So as soon as I went to National Gandhi Museum and I sat down, the director, even before speaking to me, he said, welcome, you opened a cupboard and gave me a file. That was the original <laughs> medical file of Mahatma Gandhi. It had blood tests of Gandhiji, it had all the other tests, and it had three cardiograms. Now this was taken in 1937 in Calcutta. So I started thinking, what do I do with this? Because one of the most important things about Gandhi is he has the kindest of hearts. He was spiritual in the true sense. And he had the kindest of heart. And I wanted to know how this heart sounds like. So I converted this cardiogram into Gandhi's heart sounds. Now you know that any graph can be converted into sound. And what you are about to hear are Gandhi's heart sounds. Conflicts happening in the world today. 
This is the goodbye when I love this cartoon. I mean, this is a total analysis. And Gandhi's idea, mind you, of religion was very, very important. If I have to talk, talk about the most religious and the spiritual person of the second, second 21st century, it was Gandhi. And it is not just me saying it. People like Einstein and people like uh, Roma Roland and people like, uh, I mean, so many people have endorsed it. Roma Roland actually wrote when we met Gandhi, uh, Roma Roland, the French author, uh, Roma Roland, he wrote when he met Gandhi, he said, when he gave me a hug, it was a hug of Jesus Christ. That comes from Roma Roland. So Gandhi was one of the most uh, spiritual persons who ever lived. And, uh, well, so Gandhi's idea of religion is very important and very interesting and must be taught and studied today. Because, you know, in his ashram, there were multi-religious prayers every day. But there was never a temple, there was never a mosque or a gurudwara or no other religious shrine. But there were prayers from all religions. And the root of these prayers goes back in 1897 when Gandhi was traveling to South Africa. He's going to South Africa and of course Zanzibar, there's a big storm and the ship is rocking and everybody feels that now it's all over, we are going to die. And everybody is scared. It's only Gandhi and the captain who are trying to give some solace to the uh, people to the passengers who are very scared. And Gandhi says, I heard prayers. There were Christians, there were Hindus, and there were Muslims. And they were praying. Sounds were different, but the spirit of the same. They were praying to Allah, they were praying to their own gods, but the spirit of the same. And that gave rise to this multi-religious prayers in Gandhi's ashram. And Gandhi's analysis of God is very, very interesting. Uh, he's earlier said, God is truth. But in Europe, Everybody, all the scientists were out there to be atheists. We don't believe in God. We believe only in truth, the scientific truth, any truth, but truth is what we believe in. So Gandhi changes. Gandhi says, no, if you believe in truth, you are religious. And then he says, truth is God. From God is truth, he changes to truth is God. And so that, that demolishes all the uh, so-called intellectual uh, a defiance of uh, what is God. And then again, most important uh, idea of God, which I sort of uh, am very comfortable with, is that God is not a person. God is a principle. That is so beautiful. God is a principle. So it's not a law, it's not Christ, or it is Shiva or Ganesha. It's a principle. The principle which perhaps created all this. And to that principle you bow down. And you feel humble. So humility is spiritual. That is what Gandhi's spirituality is. I'm going to make chapels of Gandhi cast in bronze, his shoes, in many sizes. One room will be full of Gandhi's chapels in bronze. You put your foot in Gandhi's shoes and you will feel something different. So that's the work part I'm doing. Einstein and Gandhi were great friends. Uh, I think the best uh, statement about Gandhi after he died comes from Albert Einstein. In Albert Einstein's study, in his office, there was only one portrait, the portrait of Gandhi. And also in Martin Luther King's office, there was only one portrait, the portrait of Gandhi. And uh, Einstein said, generations to come shall scarce believe that such a one in flesh and blood ever walked upon this earth. There's a kind of tribute he gave. Uh, there's Gandhi with his chakra and Einstein with his violin. And this is Einstein's E is equal to MC square. I think this is a very important spiritual equation. Because the idea of the material and the spiritual is demolished in this equation. And I have also sort of attached this equation to Gandhi. Recently I was speaking on Gandhi and Einstein and I ISA uh, institution in Pune. And I sort of analyzed this equation using a Gandhian uh, spectacle. E is energy here. M is the mass of the object and C is the velocity of light in Einstein's equation. So in Gandhi's equation, E is energy, M is the masses, and E and C is compassion. <laughs> so E is energy, M is masses of the world, and C is compassion. I think the masses of the world with the compassion has enough power, much bigger than the nuclear power. Because Ram Murad Lohia, one of the, the leaders, he made a wonderful statement. He says, 20, 20th century saw rise of only two powers, the Gandhi power and the atomic power. So, well, so I think that this is uh, called the pillars of the nation's conscience. This is one of my work where if you see the space between the pillars, you see Gandhi. Did you get him? 
those who are familiar with the Gandhi form, the space in between. This is the head, ears. Oh. Yeah, this Gandhi, because he's one become one with the uh, with the cosmos, with the universe. So I have created him with the elements. Uh, so in India, our practice is always a prayer. If you see, for example, these temples in Ellora, uh, all the old sculptures. The idea, the European idea of an artist who sort of does and signs his name, uh, was not prevalent in India. Uh, art practice was a prayer. You created sculptures of Shiva, you created just this temple, which you carved it out. So, uh, making of art was a prayer, and art was definitely spiritual. So, this is a temple which you just carved out in Elora. Uh, 400,000 tons of stone was removed. I mean, it's uh, very difficult to calculate, but I think it's one of the miracles in the world. Um, well, this is, you know, uh, as a boy, uh, I walked on the beach every day from the age of 6 to the age of 16 with my father. When my father died, I decided to do an installation in honor of him. So I made 500 of his portraits and I planted them everywhere we walked. So this is sort of touch connecting with my father. By just placing his portraits wherever we walked, on the hillside, and the riverside. You know, I call myself an ocean artist. I, I have to check up how much time I have. One hour. One more hour? No, no, I don't know the subject of that. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I'll take half an hour, okay? So, uh, I like to call myself an ocean artist. That's because I walked on the seaside with my father, right from the age of 6 to 16. And those walks actually uh, developed a great relationship between me and my father uh, and me in the ocean. So, ocean became a friend, and ocean became a teacher, ocean became a master, and ocean became my muse. And all my work in the last 30 years is basically kind of my prayer in the ocean. And uh, here, the waves come in, and then I'm sort of giving back to the wave. This is a sculpture of a wave in bronze which I created. You know, the oceans of the world have separated the continents. And paradoxically, the oceans of the world have also united the continents. The first contact across the oceans, I mean, the Arab ships came here, way back in 1500 BC. The oldest recorded port in, in, in the world is Lothal, which is in Gujarat, which is the first, one of the first ports in the world. And so, uh, so the, the oceans provide sort of a medium of intercontinental cultural exchanges. Uh, life originated in the ocean. Civilizations grew on the bank of the ocean. They were destroyed on the bank of the ocean. So oceans have connected and disconnected the con uh, continents. And oceans are sort of uh, mediums of uh, intercontinental cultural dialogues, cultural exchanges. And so I decided to create a kind of a bowl. There was a, a rock projecting into the ocean in Bagatol. It was like a ramp for the waves to stage a catwalk. So I made a perfect bowl, carved out a bowl in that rock. And when the water collected, uh, it sort of the, uh, I sort of precipitated the history which is dissolved in the ocean. History of human civilization is dissolved in the ocean, and with this kind of a work, I precipitated the little child you may not be posed. This is, uh, I'm going to show you a few works connected with the ocean, which, uh, as I told you, is my master and my muse. And the ocean has played a huge role in making of human civilization, especially the coastal civilization. So, this is a work which is a celebration of the ocean, and my friend Sainat has edited it.
it? Yeah. yeah. So this is a work which uh, we played with a um, hundred fishermen. I go with them on the beach, and then we have a drone uh, shooting, and we work with them doing a uh, working in a composition. You know, the ocean is very mysterious. Uh, there's another wonderful poem by Tagore. If I have to basically tell you, uh, when is the time I feel most spiritual, which is the aid to spiritualism, perhaps? If you go at the middle of the night, especially with the moon in the sky, and you swim naked in the sky, in the, in the ocean, when you are naked in the ocean, I think you, I feel connected with all the shores of the world. Mm -hmm. The ocean sort of uh, uh, connects me with the whole world. When I was 20 years old, 22 years old, I was in love with a Japanese girl. Those days there were no uh, WhatsApp button, so you would send a, a postcard. So I used to sort of write a postcard to her. On this day, you start wading uh, in the ocean in Tokyo, and I will do it here, and we will be connected. When you're 24 years old, anything is possible. <laughs> anything is possible. So this is the way ocean connects. And uh, there's a lovely poem by Tagore. It says, uh, water in a glass is sparkling and clear. The water in a glass is sparkling and clear. The water in the ocean is dark and deep. Small truths are easy to understand. Great truths have great silence. It's beautiful. I wish it was mine. <laughs> so this is, uh, I work with the fishermen, and the fishermen become the kill of a boat. Mm. The fishermen sort of just touched their fish. So this is a miracle. I mean, the fishermen can be converted, transformed into a boat. That's what uh, the touch of the divine does to you, transforms you. So it is possible uh, that art uh, has a power to that, to that kind of a transformation. sit in some kind of a divine ritual to pray to the ocean. They become the protectors of the ocean. Uh, recently I went to Gujarat uh, standing in queue to pay their uh, prayers, offer their prayers to the ocean. It's called Shore Line. <laughs> I went to Gujarat there's a place called Mandi. Mandvi is a place in Kutch area of Gujarat, and which was a very important port. And they used to make big wooden dows. And now they don't, don't no more make wooden dows. They still make a few, just for the recreation of some rich Arabs. But there are lots of dows which are lying there. So, uh, with one rich Arab smile. <laughs> <laughs> no, because they are not going to use these dows for transportation of goods. But then uh, the, one of the dow makers I met, he said, I'm making this for somebody from Dubai who will just uh, use it for recreation, so just for going around. So he's making this uh, reincarnation of a dow which was used in the 8th, 9th century. Uh, for, uh, so uh, I bought uh, some pieces of these dows because these dows are history. I met a lot of sailors who have been on that dow. And who have been to Africa, who have been to the Persian Gulf and to the uh, Red Sea. And so I interviewed them and I sort of collected all the lovely stories of these sailors. And then I bought pieces of these boats, which are useless anyway for them now. So they sold me the pieces. And then I decided I would create a work of art. So I created this. Mm -hmm. So now this is a work which is created with the pieces of the Daos from. Uh, and so, what am I doing here? I'm using history as a medium of sculpture. All the stories of the Daos, all the songs of the sailors, all the storms and all the uh, sort of whatever they experienced during the voyages is all contained in this piece of wood. And so that piece of wood, which is full of history and stories, becomes the medium of my sculpture. So my sculpture becomes a kind of a memory device. So again, the art has the power to sort of reclaim memory and, and, and store memory. So this is again a Dao. And uh, I spoke to this sailor who was on this, and he told me that we used to take manual ties uh, to Africa on this, in this dance. 
Uh, these are objects which are immersed in the ocean and the oyster shells develop there. So now, and oh, you with the ocean. So all this, all my life I used to create work on the seaside. And then I decided why not work with the ocean. So I decided to sign a memorandum of understanding with the ocean. And this is what I do. Now this, <laughs> this is, I imagine that life originated in the ocean. And you know, we know very little about the bottom of the ocean. We know more about the space. And so I decided, I will, there's some kind of a life must be existing at the bottom of the ocean, which we don't know of. Uh, there is every possibility because we have not yet been to the bottom of the ocean. We have been to the space, but not to the ocean. Because of the heavy pressure, it's not possible. And so, uh, I just imagine that there is some kind of a life form there, and they decide one day to come to the earth to check out how we are looking after the earth. And so this is called a second evolution. So I have 500 of these heads. <laughs> coming from the ocean. Then I decided that there must be an empire and the emperor is going in a procession. So I created the royal staff of the emperor of the ocean, kept it in the ocean for three and a half years and the oyster shells developed in it. So this is a work which is in collaboration with the ocean and I did this, uh, uh, this is an anchor which is kept in the ocean and the oyster shells developed. So it's completely full of ocean, uh, of the uh, oyster shells and then I apply some kind of a uh, uh, the, the real pearls on it. I embellish it with pearls, real pearls. And so this is a work in collaboration with the ocean and I don't know how much to charge for it because I have no idea how much the ocean charges per hour. <laughs> <laughs> so these are called the, 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 like the honeycombs, the ocean combs. The plates in ceramics which I create and sometimes I buy old plates and then make a cage and they lower it at the bottom of the ocean and it remains there. And then I put it out and there are surprises. Damien Hurst also does a similar thing, but he actually does not put it in the ocean. He only uh, creates an act of removing it. Damien Hurst is one of the very uh, important artists in the world. And the tires, the plates. I have done hundreds of these plates. I create the plates and keep them in the ocean. And maybe I might do something more with it. Yeah, so the pearls you see there. So these are all the works in collaboration with the ocean. You know, one of the best metaphor for the ocean I heard was, I was uh, last month in Lisbon attending an international conference of Indian Ocean. And uh, one of the speakers, I mean, he, I think, gave the most beautiful metaphor to the ocean. He says the ocean is the amniotic fluid of culture. <laughs> beautiful. The ocean is the amniotic fluid of culture. Uh, I really love that. There's a, you know, as a child, I used to walk on the beach early morning at 6 o'clock, uh, hoping to find some treasure. Because during monsoons, the ocean sort of brings everything out. And you think that, okay, some treasure will come, and I will be the first one to find it. I never found a treasure. But it developed such a relationship between me and the ocean, especially going there and to be alone with the ocean at 6 o'clock in the morning, and looking through all that dirt which is washed ashore. Okay, so when I was a child, there was not much dirt. Now there's a lot of plastic. Actually now, if you want to do the market studies for the late chips or uncle chips or what is doing well, go to the beach during monsoon and you will see all those times. Yeah. There is, there is, um, it's no jokes, but it's predicted that in 2050, the weight of plastic in the ocean is going to be more than the weight of fish. It's a very sad thing, but uh, that's what is predicted. But anyway, uh, so I started sort of looking for treasures. I never found those treasures, but then I sort of connected with the things which I watched the show. I started collecting them bring them to my studio and make a drawing of this. So this piece of wood is a plywood, but the, oh, the waves have played upon it and how many textures have developed. You should come to my museum and have a look at this, the originals. A uh, museum which is uh, just 10 minutes from here, uh, but it's closed tomorrow. It's open every, it's open every day from 10 to 6 except Monday. Yeah? So you're most welcome. So uh, these are works which I create on pieces of wood which is washed ashore. These are sort of, I'm trying to make new mythology of the ocean. Right mythology, think of uh, uh, empires at the bottom of the ocean. <coughs> uh, this is just a stone and a coconut. Oh, I must tell you how the coconut is called coconut. When the Portuguese came here, they looked at this coconut. Uh, what do you see there? It looks like a monkey. And in Portuguese, uh, monkey is macaco. So they called it macaco nut, which became coconut. <laughs> so etymology of the words is also very, very interesting. Anybody from Portuguese speaking here? No, Spanish class. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. So, one of my first installations was accidental. You know, this is the beauty of art, and it's also the beauty of spirituality, and that's why they're sisters. Because many times, what you create, you don't plan. It just happens. You yourself are surprised. Why? Right? From where did this idea come to you? How did it happen? It's like when you look at a little baby and baby sleeping and the baby smiles in between. You don't know why the baby smiles. The same with ideas just come to you from somewhere divine. When I sort of sleep, I get dreams. And I get dreams which are objects of art which I have never seen in my life. And these are the objects which I'm going to create. Because the basic difference between a computer and a human brain is when you switch off the computer, it is sleep. It doesn't do any work. But human brain does not sleep. If you're thinking about some object and of a work of art, when you're sleeping, the brain is still working and the work comes to you in the form of a dream. And then I always have a notebook next to my pillow and jot it down. So in that sense, my dreams are my notebooks, my sketchbooks. The dreams become sketchbooks. So uh, why I'm talking about this is, uh, I had not even planned this work. I had just created a disc in copper for some reception of a hotel, a five-star hotel. Uh, because like all artists, when you start to make a beginning, you have to do some decoration for some hotel, which I also did. And so I made this disc and then I took it to the beach. I dug a crater, put a disc on the top of it, put electrical bulb under it, ran a wire into the sand to a shack. And when I put the lights on, I couldn't believe my own eyes. It was like I had created a new planet. Hmm? Uh, so the, the light was so ethereal. That's the word ethereal. Well, ethereal is very connected with the spiritual. Because it is something which is not just the senses. You got goose pimples. Because when the, when the, when the, the, the dark, when the, the evening started progressing, it kept changing. And it was kind of a very special light. And then I started working with sand and light and I did many, many works. These are just cones with just a crater in the sand and a cone. This is called the memory of sunset on the sand. The sunset, the sand is remembering. These are very, very simple words. I just have grooves and there's an electrical bulb behind it. That's it. Just a hole in the sand and lights. Then I started planting shells. When I was a doctor and I started doing my watercolors on the roadside, my patients thought that this fellow is a fool. Because I was a very successful doctor and giving up medicine and sitting on the roadside and doing a watercolor. I mean, I said, what is he doing? I mean, <laughs> normally uh, people thought that uh, uh, they asked me. But they said, okay, normally people like to climb up the ladder of success. Why did you come down? <laughs> so everybody thought that I have come down the ladder of success. But I can tell you one thing. I have been doing this for the last 30 years. Well, before that... Uh, then they saw me planting shells on the beach. <laughs> now, at least for drawing, painting on the roadside is acceptable. Now he is an adult planting shells, so he must be admitted to the mental asylum. <laughs> That's what they seriously thought. And, well, I kept on, and they didn't understand how planting of shell can be a profession for an adult man. <laughs> how can that be a profession? So I kept planting shells, and I must tell you, I have planted shells, mussel shells, all over the world. I got an award of some 7,000 uh, 7, uh, euros in Korea for one of the works, and I created some work in Korea, I've done it in Denmark, I've done it in many countries of the world. So, uh, this is the work where I plant shells. This is during low tide. I have made a circle using shells. So, this is a circle during low tide, and then, as you know, the tides are caused by the moon. So, this is my moon created with shells. And now I wait for the high tide to come. And the high tide comes and drowns the moon, who is the creator of the tides. So that's the poetry of the moon. So if you have imagination, you can actually hold the moon in your hand. And that's precisely, and now this is a work which is again moon created with uh, shells, and then Kauri, Kauri shells, and then there's a projection mapping which uh, my friend Sainath has created. Where in a room you have this, and then all this thing keeps happening, where it's waxing and waiting for the moon. Mm. And slowly the light moves again. Just a mirror and the ocean and a camera. 
it's like making the intangible tangible, seeing what is not seen. Well, they say the ocean, you know, the, 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 you saw my uh, installation, the shells are destroyed by the ocean. So, uh, Tagore has another poem, it says, the waves write their poetry on the sand and wipe it off over and over again. No. So, these installations are kind of my poetry on the sand and I allow the waves to 